Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer Thurlow, and I will be the moderator today for this talk. We're, of course, here to talk with Janine Beichman and, and her latest book, Well Versed. But I'm going to go ahead and read just brief bio real quick for myself and Janine, and then we'll get into a reading. We'll get to hear some of these poems from Janine. So I am the current poet laureate of my hometown in uh, West Tisbury, Massachusetts, on the island of Martha's Vineyard, for those uh, who might not know where West Tisbury is. And for that, I, I lead community uh, readings, I do workshops and more. My, my own poetry uh, or translations from the Japanese have appeared in the Georgia Review, Grant, Cincinnati Review, Worcester Review, and, and others. With Eric Hyatt, I, I co-translated Sonic Peace by Kiryu Minashita, which came out from Phoneme Media in 2017. And that was shortlisted for the ALTA, the American Literary Translators Association's 2018 National Translation Awards, as well at the same time, as well as the Lucian Strick Prize for Asian Translation. Janine Beichman is the author of literary biographies, uh, Masaoka uh, Shiki, His Life and Works, uh, which was 2002, and also Embracing the Firebird, Yosono no Akiko, and the Birth of the Female uh, Voice in Modern Japanese Poetry. That was also in 2002, uh, among That's others. Great. Besides Well Versed, her most recent book, which is, is Beneath the Sleepless Tossing of the Planets, Selected Poems, uh, 1972, to 1989 by Makoto, who we were talking a little bit about earlier. That, that came out in 2019, and it won the 2019-2020 Japan-U.S. Friendship Commission Prize for the translation of Japanese literature. She's also a judge. Jeannie's also a judge for the JLPP translation competition, and she received her PhD from Columbia uh, University and is a professor uh, emerita for, uh, of Daito Bunka uh, University. And just a quick note on the anthology, the original author, Ozawa Minoru, who, who compiled this haiku. He is a prominent Japanese haiku poet and critic, and among other poet, and among uh, other publications and, and criticism, he he's, he has three haiku collections of his own in print. And uh, Shinkang, which came out in 2006, won the Yomiuri Prize for the Yomiuri Literature Prize for Poetry. I think we have some group members here. I was hearing some introductions uh, before, but he founded the uh, haiku group Sawa in 2000, and which he continues to direct. So he's also a member of the board of directors of the Association of Haiku Poets, and he serves as, and he serves as a judge for haiku columns in the Yomiuri Shinbun, Tokyo Shinbun, and others. So between Janine and Ozo, it's super great, really spectacular team and the book the product itself the book is amazing we'll talk about it more and we'll talk about it after janine reads but this production is it, it's just a it's a beautiful volume of poetry and i can't wait to hear some poems some of jean's favorite poems and uh, janine's favorite poems and uh, talk about them a little bit so janine if it's if it's okay why don't you why don't you take it away and share some of the... Okay, I'm just wondering if I should introduce the team who was responsible for this book now or wait till I've read the poems. But I think I'm going to do it now. If that's Yeah, okay. go for it. <laughs> yeah, this was actually a team project, which is how Japan Library works. And the project director was Riko Komanoya, or Komanoya Riko, who I believe is here today, at least she's registered. And the way it worked was she set up a schedule about what we should do and so on. Okay, here it is. Okay, I'm going to read five haiku from th that I picked out from out of the 350 or so that are in the book. First, I'm going to read them in English, just one after the other. Then I'll go back and talk about them a little bit. So here goes. Reflected in the horse's eye, red camellias, dawn. For my rendezvous with the blossoms, I put on new underwear. Cool moonlight, the god of forgetting slips in and out of my brain. My eyeballs go deep into cloud covered peaks. The wind changes, all things release their autumn voices. So now I'll go back. I, I think Lisa is now going to put up the slides. Am I right, Lisa? I can do that. Give me just yeah. a second. 
Janine, I just I wanted to say thank you um, so much for sharing that. You know, while you while you were dropped out for a minute, I was talking about how much I care about you know production and but the poems themselves too. It, it, what what makes it worth it? So that was just thank yeah, you. beautiful. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, so this is the cover of the book. In case for people who don't have it yet, it's a little bit hard to purchase so far. Although the ebook is available now. But the hard copy is available is not available in the United States yet. So that's the cover. We can do the next slide. This is a sample of what the pages in the book look like. First, you have the translation above, then you have the author's name, then you have Ozawa-san's explanation. This is not my explanation. It's my translation of Ozawa-san's explanation. Then beneath that, we decided to add Romaji, the, the original poem in Romanized Japanese, and then a literal translation of each word beneath it. And the season word is light is the lighter gray portion. It's only in the um, Japanese. And then beneath it, at the very bottom of the page, um, is a short biograph profile of the poem. So that's this just repeats for every page. Each poem takes one page. Okay, next slide, please. And th this is what I just read, but we can go on, okay? I think that, the, yeah, reflected in the horse's eye, red camellias. This is by Yoshida Toyo and Ume, Uma no me ni utsurite akaki tsubaki kana. So if you do it literally, it's as it shows beneath. And then I added for this presentation, the Japanese kanji. And Ozawa-san's explanation of this discusses where, if the person is walking or riding the horse and why the red camellias might be reflected in its eyes, in its eye. And let me just see, I'm sorry, where did I put, how do I get, I wanna make this a little bit smaller, Lisa. Well, it's okay. Anyway, and then he compares it to Basho's famous poem about his horse having eaten um, a flower and discusses how it's different. And he's basically in dialogue with the poem. But th this poem is kind of interesting to me because when I first translated it, I thought it was, you know, what is this? It's a little bit silly and a little bit hard to imagine and how would a flower be reflected in the horse's eye and so on. But the funny thing is that it has, uh, it's come back to me several times and it has a quality that I've come to call stickiness. It just kind of stays in your mind. And I still don't quite understand it, but I sort of do understand it and I can visualize what's happening. So it's an interesting poem. Janine, if I just wanted to, you, you talked about a description there. Do you, I, we can search for it and I can read it later, but do you happen to have that here to share? Okay, I'll read it. Leading yeah. a horse along, the poet comes upon a camellia bush with red flowers in bloom and notices that the flowers are reflected in the horse's eye. Where is he positioned in order to see the horse's eye? He might be standing near the horse, but in that case, the camellias would be close by, so the element of surprise would be lacking. We might also imagine the poet is mounted on the horse and arriving at a spot close to the camellias, but from horseback, it would surely be difficult to see the horse's eye. So I read it as him walking along, leading the horse. Let me just interpolate. Here he's discussing what we call POV in fiction writing. So it's interesting that he's using this literary idea um, and applying it. Then he goes on, Toyo must have had in mind Basho's haiku. The wayside mallow was gobbled up by my horse in Nozarashi Kiko, 1685. Unlike Basho, however, Toyo did not compose his poem while on horseback, and his horse did not eat flowers. The flower, and then he, he ends, he often ends with a sentence that just kind of punches you in the eye. The flowers reflected in the horse's eye suggest a kind of dark passion. 
I love that because suddenly this very concrete thing, where is the horse? What is he doing? What's happening? Suddenly he sort of tosses all that aside and goes into the realm of emotion and it's very intense. And that may in fact be why this poem has acquired a kind of stickiness for me because the red camellias suddenly are not just flowers, but they symbolize a whole realm of passion of unnamed ambiguous but very intense passion mm. see I, I like thank you for reading that the description i think um the description is very unique and i've i've only i've encountered it in other sort of well i when i first saw it it immediately reminded me of my um version of the hyakuni nishi which, which i have here that also has sort of it has the original poem and then it has sort of like a breakdown in the description of it but for me the way that this page is laid out it just I think it really works because I can I can appreciate the poem just as it stands and then the description that Ozo san presents eases you into an analysis of the of the poem and it, it's softer than a footnote but it's also meaningful. It's not just kind of fluff. So I think there's a sweet spot that that he and, and you with your translation really hit talking about these poems and giving references and connecting them. So that's wonderful. Thank you. I'm reviving my references to the to the page numbers as you talk. That's why I'm writing. Yeah, oh sure. Okay, should we go to the next one? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Dawn, for my rendezvous with the blossoms, I put on new underwear. <laughs> I love this poem. Ono Rinka is a very, one of the very famous modern haiku poets, by the way. Akebono ya hana ni awamuto hadaki kae. Okay, so I, I love Ozawa-san's, what's the word, his explanation of it. So yeah, maybe read a little bit of it. Well, I guess I may as well read the whole thing. It doesn't take that long. The poet has gotten up early to go cherry blossom viewing. However, he doesn't use the word see or view. He has chosen the, the word au, literally to meet, a word ordinarily used for people, making this a kind of personification. The blossoms are not mere plants. It is almost as if he is going to meet with a living spirit I put on new underwear can be read as suggesting the kind of reverence one might feel for a God at whose holy site one is preparing to worship. It could also be read as expressing a certain sensuality as if looking forward to making love after a long separation. I take it as both reverential and sensuous at once. He has yet to see the blossoms when he writes down this poem, but hints of their holy presence are already making themselves felt from beyond the dawn. So I, I think that's one of his, well, I, I really love all his explanations, but I particularly like this because when you first read it, you wonder what is going on with this new underwear? You know, it's sort of funny, but then when you read his explanation, you see that it has, it has a spiritual and a sensuous meaning both at once. So it really, the poem kind of swells and increases in meaning before your eyes, thanks to the explanation. Uh, Janine, you mentioned Ono Rinka was uh, very famous. On the bottom of, of these of these pages too, there's usually like a uh, kind of like a bio of the poet. What is it? What is it? Just just to give our readers an example, what does it say about Ono Ninka? Ono Ninka, 1904-1982, was a follower of Usuda Aro and a contributor to Shakunage. Post-war, he founded and led Hama. He was also editor-in-chief of Kadokawa Shoten's influential magazine Haiku, and an esteemed haiku critic who mentored many younger poets. This poem is from Hoenshu, 1979. This doesn't really explain to you his place in modern haiku. And we had a lot of trouble with the profiles because they, they don't, they were just little, they were just little short bios of the poet. But if you really want to understand the history of modern haiku, they weren't they weren't really sufficient. And this book is not really directed towards that. It's not a historical book. So it just, you know, some things are explained in the notes a little bit more, 
Well, for me, for me, when I read those profiles at the bottom, they always, they raised like tons of questions. Like I wanted right. to know like what all these groups were in a really, in a really good way. You know, I was really just curious about this world kind of that I, that I knew nothing. Well, that was where your question came up that you posed to me when we first met over Zoom was, you know, what is the structure of the world? Do you, do they have like a meeting every year where all the groups get together? Do they communicate with each other? <laughs> and I yeah. was sort of not, I don't think there is a group like that. There are a couple of haiku kyokai, and then there's the haiku bungakan, I think it's called, which has a library of all haiku books. So there are national organizations, but they don't really have, you know, yearly meetings where everyone gets together to exchange. It's more like a lot of small to large groups. Some maybe have a hundred, I don't know. And then of course, a lot of the communication between haiku poets takes place is in the haiku columns of various newspapers and in the magazines that are devoted to haiku. So- now my, my under, Sorry, my, my understanding was that maybe in the mid 20th century, or in the early 20th century too, Hototogisu was like kind of the dominant right. haiku group. And it, you know, you were either in or kind of out with that. Right. And, That's but true. it seems like now, at least moving towards the latter half and into 21st century, it's sort of, yeah, as you say, split. And there's uh, many different. Right. There's a strange thing in the history of modern haiku. I think you get Shiki rescuing haiku from its doldrums and it's, it's old fashioned sort of game type thing, making it into a serious form of literature. And Shiki actually thought that there were two kinds of poetry. There was the poetry of imagination and the poetry of realism. He called them chasse and kuso, kuso, kuso or diso. And he thought both were good, but that, for, but that it was a little bit harder to write poems of imagination. And he thought Busson, who, combined those two things, realism and imagination, was one of the greatest poets. So he revived Busson. But the, what I'm trying to, what the point that I want to make is that now Shiki, as a, as a critic, is conflated with his, the ideas of his disciple, Takahama Kyoshi, who was very much oriented towards haiku as a poetry of realism, nature, and the sketch from life, and was narrower than Shiki, but was much more of an emperor of the haiku world. And I see, if you see the haiku, the history of haiku from Shiki is a kind of snake slithering along. You know how when snakes eat a mouse, there's like a bump in the middle of them for a while as it goes down. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. See, I see Kyoshi as that bump, <laughs> you know, a sort of hiccup. And now it's been kind of digested and the, the people who were kind of against Kyoshi or who didn't suit him or who were called into different ways, they're all you know, free to express who they are. And the haiku world is much, much more diverse and much better for it than it was during Kyoshi's reign. Kyoshi died in 1957. He lived a long and happy life. He did do some good things. I'm not saying he was all bad. He was. He had a daughter and a wife who practiced haiku, so it made him pretty receptive to women, except for Sugita Hisajo, who's one of the greatest women haiku poets of the modern period and whom he kind of destroyed. But on, on the whole, I think, you know, he he's bad. <laughs> I'm against Kyoshi. It I'm like not Kyoshi, and I think things are a lot better now. It sounds like there was sort of, I mean, some dynamic forces at work. We were talking about this just briefly before before the um, talk started, but you're saying it before Shiki, the haiku was a kind of like a joke, sort of like it was a game and you'd like bet money on it or something. But after, after then, Basho and after Busson, yeah. Because, yeah, after Basho, yeah, after, yeah. but the, it's sort of like, as you say, went into a doldrum and then, yeah, Shiki kind of brought it together and then... Right. Kyoshi, yeah. yeah. Takahama uh, Kyoshi, yeah. Takahama Kyoshi really, yeah, made a hard discipline out of it, kind of. And now we get to see this, yeah, blooming. Uh, of, flowering, a thousand flowers blooming, yeah. Cool, very cool. Okay, yeah. let's go on to the next poem. Yes. So I love this one. <laughs> okay. Cool moonlight, the god of forgetting slips in and out of my brain. Anyone over the age of 50 really loves this poem. <laughs> so... <laughs> This is by Hayashi Shō. Tsuki suzushi no ide yuru wasuregami. So this is page, let's see, 187. Yeah. 
So I'll read this explanation too. As we age, we often lose track of the names of people and things. It never occurred to me that such a trifling mundane experience could be the subject of a poem. This, which again, inter, to let me interpolate, this shows the diversity of modern haiku. This poem attributes such memory lapses to the god of forgetting, wasuregami, a word that is not in the Nihon Kokugo Daiji Ten, the multi-volume unabridged dictionary of the Japanese language. Did the poet make it up? If he did, it's an elegant coinage. He may have been using it privately for some time. Be that as it may, I can't help being surprised that there is nothing unpleasant about this god. As the god slips in and out of the poet's tired brain, the cool moonlight shines down, bestowing a feeling of relaxation and refreshment. You feel the poet is at peace with the world. So that this again, you can feel Ozawa san is in dialogue with the poem. He's asking a question. Yeah. Did the poet make it up? He might as well be talking to the poet, saying, "Did you make this up, Hayashi san?" Or That's a good word for it. Yeah, he's he's talk. He's speaking with the with the poet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's why it's so charming. He's not trying to be up there and mansplaining everything. He's All just right. talking to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next one. My eyeballs go deep into cloud-covered peaks. Kyugyu nami, gankyu no wakeite iku kumo no mine. So this is a poem by what Ozawa-san calls avant-garde poets. It's page 175. They're young poets usually. She, let's see, when, this was published in 2007. And this poet actually is kind of interesting. This, this is from the profile. She knew Spanish very well. And in the afterward to one of her haiku collections, she did, in the collection in which this poem appears, she describes that she came, how she came to haiku through reading the Spanish translation of Basho's Oku no Hosomichi, the, the Road to the Interior, a translation that was made by the, the really famous Spanish poet Octavio Paz. So there are many interesting sort of threads connected here. Wow. And anyway, so I mean, I mean, I think I may as well read this explanation too. Is that okay? It's not too much or is it enough? Well, I mean, I guess, so my question would be is, do you, I mean, I know we sort of structured this, like you were just going to talk about it. But right, here, okay. I, I'm not going to read the explanation. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a yes, please from the, from the chat. So yeah, if it's short, I, I would say go okay. ahead. Well, as short as the other ones. Jumping out from the eye sockets, the eyeballs fly off. So, I mean, she really means what she says, okay? They go all the way in among the cloud-covered peaks. The poet is not simply gazing at the mountains from a distance. This is clearly not a world that could exist in reality, but there is more to the poem than that. Giving myself up to the illusion as I read, I feel as if I am in a dream, a waking dream, and enjoy the dizzy sensation as different kinds of clouds touch my eyeballs. Here again, he's, it's not so much that he's in dialogue with the poem, but he's kind of let it take him over, and he's just reporting to you what it feels like. Then he goes on, the words go deep into, bring to mind this well-known poem by Taneda Santoka, deep I go, deep I go, and still green mountains. This is one of the iconic poems of modern haiku, but I'm just interpolating it. In Santoka's poem, the body cannot escape the verdant mountains, but here in Nami's poem, the eyeballs leave the surface of the earth and enter deep into mountains hidden in clouds. Perhaps Nami's image of cloud-covered peaks came from Santoka's green mountains. So here, you know, to go back to this theme of dialogue, he's seeing two poets in dialogue and then sort of commenting on it from the side. Yeah. Goes, so, yeah. Well, no, I was just going to sort of inter interject, I, I suppose. Yeah, please. Um, but uh, since we've been talking about these explanations and, and, you know, I said too at the beginning, they were such a big thing for me. You know, we, were, we, we said too at the beginning, we, we wanted to sort of talk about the, the project as a whole and the roles different people had. Now, as I understand you, 
Janine solely focused on on the haiku translation. That was like, that was your job, so to speak. And then these explanations, do you want to talk just a little bit about how those, how, how those became translated? And as, as part of the Japan Library well-versed, well-versed well, project? Well, I translated those too. I you did? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I translated everything. The the content, oh, okay. yeah, the notes were um, written by mostly by Yuiko, and I read them over, and then a few they asked me to do because they were like within my sphere of expertise. With the people could have commented on the poems, but there were very few comments about them. The explanations were very very difficult for me to do. And when I began, I don't know, all along the way, actually, Meredith was a lifesaver on those because she would just, I don't know how she did it, but she would make a little change here, a little change there. And then it would just come off so much better. And I learned a lot from looking at what she corrected and at her comments. I learned so much from it. Um, so that by the very, very end, and I mean by the very, very end, maybe the last one or two, I felt I was doing a little bit better, but actually I would say most of the credit for the final polish to the, to the explanations really is to Meredith. Um, now just to be sort of clear so everyone understands, Meredith you know, happens to be an award-winning translator, right? And is, is, is uh, quite accomplished. I think she may be uh, here present today, but there is some expert, very expert guidance right. help, right. so. Right, and the very deep knowledge of all things Japanese. The, the way the process worked was I would translate what you see on the page and then I would send it to Yuiko, who was the Japanese checker. And she would do things like, because we only had eight months to do this book. I told them at the beginning, I was not converting dates from Heisei and so on to Western style. I was not gonna look up Romaji readings for people's names and so on. And all that kind of work that usually you would do as a translator, I said mm -hmm. that I'm going to have, please have the Japanese checker do that. I also said that I wasn't going to be able to do any notes. And so Yuiko, in addition to checking my English against the Japanese and, and pointing out any inaccuracies, would also furnish dates converted into Western and any readings that needed to be furnished and answer any questions that I had about things I didn't understand. Then I would get it back, I would revise it, then I would send it to Lisa who was supposed only to read it as English and you know, catch any mistakes of syntax or things that were unclear. But in fact, she went way beyond that. And when things were unclear, she delved back into the Japanese or thought about things. And it was in really incredible what she did. And then I would get it back from her and I would try to make it read as well as I could in terms of English. And then I would send it to Meredith, who would again bring it to another level in terms of style, which, as I said, was incredibly instructive to me. And then, oh, to answer Stephen Carter's thing, he just has a question. The significance of the grayed out text is that's the season word. That's the Kigo. Um, oh, good. Thank yeah. you. We were actually, that was like in my notes to like, you know, point yeah, that out. I thought yeah, I said that, that, go, yeah. But anyway, yeah. And so then when I got it back from Meredith, then I would look at it again and I would mostly take her suggestions. And then I would send it on after a certain amount had amassed, I would send it on to Rico. And then we had, after that was done, then we did the whole thing over again. <laughs> Don't ask me why. <laughs> if Rico's here, Just maybe she's going to play. <laughs> That was our second round. And after the second round, Meredith went through the second round. Then there was a third round that Meredith didn't participate in. And then we had proofs. I mean, it was like a never ending process. And even now I'm still finding little things that I wish I had, you know, done and so on. I mean, Janine, thank you. It was very intense. <laughs> what? Illustrating this. No, I mean, what you're talking about is how to produce something that's, that's high quality, which is what we have here. And, you know, People very rarely see, you know, how how many drafts things go through, and and just how much decision making and sort of combined effort a lot of this um, stuff takes to get such like a, a, a polished uh, volume that we can all I that we can all enjoy. I think the most important thing you said though was eight months, which is right. uh, I, 
I couldn't imagine doing a project like this in eight months. <laughs> that is um, simply just wow. I mean, the work, yeah, the work must have been intense. But I want to. So this is the all question. Twenty-four hours a day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for me anyway. Yeah. I mean, fun, but but also like, wow. But actually, there was the question about the Kigo. I wanted to talk too about just the structure. And we have this picture here, which is which is great. And, and if, if you just want to maybe take a, a minute or two and, and talk about, well, the the way in which the haiku, your ha the, the translated haiku appears on the page is oh, not right. very traditional I would say like you know usually there's just three lines um, running down but also the other you know the choice to put the ink to sort of put the direct translation below the romaji and then in the book actually the choice not to include the original Japanese mm -hmm. and those are all sort of very kind of dynamic things and if you want to touch on that or maybe someone else wants to touch on that those were all my decisions. So I think that's a three part question. The form that I used, the first thing I did when I was translating was I thought, you know, how am I, what is the form that I'm going to use for this? So I looked at a lot mm -hmm. of haiku books to see what they do, you know, ones that are all left justified, no capitals, then some that are the first line is is sort of indented more, and then the second line is indented less and more. And there's all kinds of ways to do it. And mm -hmm. I decided that that I wanted the poem to occupy the entire page in terms of width, and I wanted it to be larger in type. I wanted the translation to have pride of place because that's what it's about, it's poetry. And then I, I don't remember now exactly why I, I wanted it to be three lines because he talks about it that way. And there was a question of having to align the translation with the explanation. I didn't want people to look at the translation and think, what is he talking about when he's talking about, you know, the first segment, the second segment. Right. He, he, I don't use the word lines in my translation because haiku is not really divided into lines, it's divided into five, right. seven, five, three different segments. So I needed it to have B in three. But I didn't, I didn't like this, you know, this kind of everything left justified. I know there are places where it looks really good, but it kind of made me feel claustrophobic. And I wanted something that was more open and dynamic. And I may also have been influenced by William Carlos Williams' three-line indented form, simply because my husband happened to be studying him at that time. So I was seeing it. I don't know. But anyway, it seemed to me the three lines progressively indented and with their margins, the, mar the, the right and left margin of the first and third segment being the right and left margin of the page as a whole was gonna give the most open feeling. And I guess that's what I wanted, an open feeling. And also something that would go work for every poem. I didn't wanna keep changing things around. So that was like a pretty early decision which was very difficult for the designer. And Rico had some, Rico and I had to discuss that at length because, you know, how was it gonna work? And when it actually came into proofs, I was allowed to look at each poem in itself and say, okay, put the third line starting at, at say the, the T of the second line, please do it that way. They let me make very, very tiny adjustments like that, which, is what makes it work what if it does work so I'm, I'm really grateful for that so that's the form of the translation and when Ozawa-san later said Ozawa-san also liked it because he has a theory of haiku as a link between heaven and earth and uh -huh. and it goes back to Jomo and it's it's in the preface if you get the ebook and you want to read it and he thought that this kind of suggested that because it goes up a bit like a ladder so that worked out. He liked that too. I and love this. So no, I just want to say real quick. I, I just love this deviation of form and well, helping an English audience. When we talk about this book, you know, talking about really pointed at someone who who doesn't speak Japanese at all. And, and for me personally, when I learned that haiku wasn't in three lines or tanka wasn't in six or whatever five. It was like a watershed moment for me that I could actually write things on one line. Oh, really? So this kind of like kind of hints at that. And I think it's really cool. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So then putting the, then the, of course there's the explanation and then, which I wanted to have slightly smaller type, but not really small. And then putting the um, literal translation in was just, 
I didn't think much about that, but I just thought, well, I have to do this because otherwise, you know, how are people going to see where I got the translation from if they don't know Japanese? And even if they do know Japanese, I want them to know that I know my translation is not a literal representation of the original. So it just seemed necessary. And I also thought it would be nice if people want to use this book to try to translate themselves, that it would help, that it would help to, to have a literal translation. I mean, that's how, like Takako Lento, when she worked with W.S. Merwin on her Busson translations, she made a literal translation. She sent it to him, and then he turned it into what he into poetry. So I thought people could use literal translations like that, and so one book of translations could be the seed for many, many more books of translations. It's so cool to have that, you know, like as as a place to help not only to present um, your own work, but also, yeah, to help other other people who, who might be interested, might, might be interested. I saw a comment, like, it takes guts to do that. I was going to say, like, it takes a lot of pressure to kind of come up. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, there's some. Oh, that's Kakutani-san. Yeah. Oh, someone... I think it's a mistake. I think she doesn't mean to talk to us. She got a phone call. Okay. Yeah. No. What I was what I was saying, and someone commented, you know, it takes guts to do that, and there, well, there's a lot of pressure, you know, to to bring things literally or stick as close to the original. I mean, that's that's a whole debate. We could we could spend a few hours probably talking about. Everyone would go to sleep or eat lunch <laughs> when you talk about that. But but I respect the choice to to kind of go ahead and and not you know hug the original. It, when hug the original to the point of sacrificing the the flow or beauty of the words in English. So that is that is very great to be able to present something uh, readable. And and there was some little event you were talking to me earlier uh, too, like in the some things I learned and and about about presenting haiku in English. And I learned that even in Japanese, haiku are not always strictly seventeen symbols 17 syllables or tanka or 31 you know there's there's a little bit of play in there so i've met you know i've in poetry circles i you, you encounter people who are very sort of strict about these kinds of things but there's actually some sort of play there's there's a little bit of a leeway in that you know a poem where there's an example of that um i don't know if i have to go over let's see i've done oh yoshia there's only one more to do of the five that I read. Maybe I should just do that, but I'd like to read in, in connection with what you just said, one of the ones that I haven't shown yet, but why don't I just do Yoshias? It's page 91. It, it's the one about the paling, you know, truth pales next to lies or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is by Yoshia Nobuko and the, re the pleasures of truth pale next to those of lies under spring lamplight. I just love this. So Yoshia Nobuko is one of the, what they call the bunjin no haijin. Ozawa-san, his, his whole agenda is diversity in a certain sense. And one of the things he, that's unusual about this collection is that he includes the haiku of people who were not specifically haiku poets, but who were famous in other genres. They're called literati haiku poets. And Yoshi Anobuko was a very famous novelist who was also famous for the lesbian themes of her, of her stories. And so this is a poem about her writing. This is a poem of her writing one of her novels under, in the spring lamplight and how much she enjoys making up stories. And I think, why don't I just read what he says about it? Well, you're too, you're going to talk about choices, you know, translation choices, so to speak, you know, pale, right. truth pales, you know, you can see the Makoto Yori, the Sugatamashiya. Right, uh, exactly. Yeah, truth. Not more, there, so to speak. Yeah, and literally, it's truth is more lies than fun. But you can't, <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, please, you know, <laughs> that's, it works in Japanese, obviously. But I, I tried to make it sound the pleasures of truth pale next to those of lies. You know, you put in a little bit of alliteration and, you know, this and that. And so it just sounds a little bit better. But he says, in daily life, we avoid people who pepper their talk with lies. Convention dictates that a good person be truthful and instructs us to reject lies and affirm facts. But this poem turns that idea on its head. 
the prefatory note, and this is another thing he slips in. He always slips in little bits and pieces of knowledge about haiku that you could have a prefatory note which, set, which situates the poem. So that's something that an, a person writing haiku in English is gonna you know, put in their head and maybe make use of. The prefatory night is one night while, light, while, while writing at my desk. Nobuko must be writing a novel, which was what she did for a living. The world of fiction is impossible to create from nothing but facts. Softly lighted by the spring lamplight, lies come alive at night as she creates the love scenes in her novel. In haiku too, it is the same. There is a space between word and thing and lies step in to bridge the gap. Poetry without lies is no poetry at all. So I love that because again, he's, he's in dialogue with the poem and he's using it to kind of step out and think about haiku in general and make it and slip in this general statement. So I like that too, you know, just thinking about again, this book as, as textbook, if I bought a book of, you know, haiku rules or, or things you should do in haiku, I'd probably read that about the prefatory note, but I'd forget it. Like, next day it would just slip out of my mind it would be you know on page you know some list but when I can read it in this context it's it'll stick with me and, and I'll think about this poem now which is which is I think a nice feature yeah it's almost like you're at a haiku meeting and yeah. people are talking about it yeah Lisa can we have the one about body because I want that has to do with something that Spencer brought up the you know sorry so, hang on <laughs> yeah sure wait what page is that Ha, ha, ha. Oh, I think I have it. Here. Oh, yeah, because I'll need to get to it. Let's see. I'm, I'm skipping that one about the wind. Two more poems that I really would like to talk about, though. Okay, so this one, this is one of the avant-garde poems by someone, by Tanaka Ami, who was born in 1970. Snow, Bodhi, snow, Bodhi, snow, I fall to my knees. And the reason it's Bodhi is that, that in the original, she's used an obsolete kanji for the for the kanji that means body karada you can see it in the romaji yuki karada and so i wanted to use an obsolete an archaic word for body which appear which you pronounce bodhi and she also has in the original these dots and he talks at length about what it could mean and she also separates the second and third segments you can see in the in the japanese much more than usual. So she's really, I don't know if you would call this lifting the words off the page, but she's definitely playing with the ordinary layout. And I'll just read the last paragraph of his explanation. The extra, oh, I'm sorry. And one other thing is that what I, I was careful to include the extra spacing in the, in the original, because as I said, I had to align the translation with the explanation. And he talks about that extra space. So you have to have it in the English. And this is the last paragraph of his explanation. The extra space <coughs> between the second and third segments signifies a change of scene, at which point she suddenly falls to her knees. If you read the first two segments with their repeated words and dots as a kind of sacred mandala, she is here kneeling in homage or prayer. If you read them as the symbol of an erotic encounter, then it becomes a sign of surrender. Or could it be both? So he's opening out, you know, the poem into that. And you know, I just want to point yeah. out that the, this presents, at least for me, one of the one of the toughest um, aspects of Japanese translation, in, in, in that the the grammar the grammar grammatical choices and the choices of simply what you can do with the topography of the language are so much broader in Japanese than they are in English. Being there's you know more alpha, more phonetic alphabets and you know kind of choices, and awesome. so this is cool. Yeah. I like what you've done. I can I just do the Gornard fish? That's page three seventeen. Lisa, could you yes. not that one? Yes. This is one of my very favorites. The Gournard fish. I didn't read this before, by the way, so don't be surprised if you don't recognize it. <laughs> the Gournard fish dreams an ultramarine, O Takeseiji. This is again um, a poem from 209. It's a Heisei poem. Hobo ni konjo no yume arimikeri. 
So <clears throat> that he begins his explanation with scientific information about the gurnard fish. The gurnard is said to walk slowly along the ocean floor using the finger-like spines underneath its large pectoral fins. It also emits a croaking sound using its swim bladder. In, in the daytime, the deep blue of the ocean depths must fill the gurnard's field of vision. At night, this must become pure darkness. But if the fish dreams, and who is to say that it does not, the dream would be deep blue like the ocean and contain nothing else, either animate or inanimate. This speaks of the dreamy nation of this fish and of its solitary life. Somehow I feel that this at the same time expresses the poet's own inner life. This is not a simple objective description. The poet imagines himself as a living fish and the process of composition begins from there. I just love this. The poet imagines himself as a living fish. I mean, how does he know? But the point is that he's thinking himself into the poet and he's so with him that, that that's where he ends up. But if you notice, the explanation begins with a very objective scientific explanation of this fish, which is actually extremely strange. So it just has a wonderful flow to it. <clears throat> and I think one of the things that when we talk about how I translated, mm. for some reason, I always liked this translation. I didn't know why until yesterday I was looking at it. And I suddenly realized that ultramarine is the perfect word for blue in this poem because marine means the sea. <laughs> and that was actually without realizing it, why I was so pleased with that word choice. So, you know, we started with the translator's agonies, but I think that's a good place to end with the translator's ecstasy. And I'm sure someone is going to say something that punctures my ecstasy, but that also. Yeah, you know, that so is, we'll point out that it's not really ultramarine. But... I'll leave that for that. Yeah, okay. So that's <laughs> all I have to say. <laughs> Well, Janine, I mean, you've said um, a lot. That's, I mean, thank you for sharing. And, and it's so cool to get to talk, yeah, talk a little bit about this and hear about this project and your choices. And I, I hope we have a lot of, I mean, I see we have, there's 47 things in the chat. So I hope we have some cool questions coming up from you guys, from every, from everyone here. But uh, I guess, Janine, there's is there anything else you'd like to add before we break? Or should we just go ahead and... I just like, the one thing is that I keep emphasizing is when, you know, I'd always heard terrible things about translating in teams. But so I didn't know what to expect. But th it was really wonderful. Everyone was incredibly supportive. We worked so well together. And it, it, I really found it was a wonderful experience to work in a team. So it was, and especially during the pandemic, when you were so restricted in interactions with people, it became a social kind of thing too. Not that we talked about social things, but just, in, you know, communicating. Yeah. So it was a very, very positive experience for me. And also, again, I just learned so much about writing prose because thanks to Meredith. <laughs> well, I can see some people, a few different people asked questions. Kevin Steinbach has a question. Um, yeah. There. And I'll just read it is in, in the new email. Yeah. Janine, how do you decide how to handle the order of segments in translation? Mm -hmm. And I'll read I'll read the whole thing and then we can break yeah. it down. In most of the poems, the order of images slash segments in the English uh, follows that of the Japanese, but in the God of Forgetting poem, for example, the wasudagami image is in the middle of the English before my brain, rather than in the end. Does this simply have to do with how long and weighty the expression God of Forgetting uh, could sound in English otherwise, or did you have another motivation? No, it's just, you know, if, if he doesn't discuss the order of images or the segments, then, then I feel that I'm free to do what's best poetically. So I did what worked best as English. Yeah, I find with translating poetry, order switching order around matters a lot. I uh -huh. find that 
I just have to do it, especially well for my own, when I write, I too also always co-translate or translate in a group. And, and part of that process is bringing my, my work to an English audience, meaning an audience that has no idea what Japanese sounds like or, or kanji or anything like that. And uh-huh. Oftentimes it'll be the, that group, which will pick up on something. They'll say, they'll say, oh, this sounds awkward or something. And, and you know, you, you, you take awkward and then you have to go figure out what, you know, what they're talking about with that. Right. Um, but usually for me, yeah, it comes down to order, switching mm-hmm. something around, like, like maybe what you were saying in that. In yeah, that I try to it. keep the order as much as possible. That I always begin with that, but sometimes it doesn't work. And in the end, it's it's what works as English that becomes the test stone. But yeah. then there's this other problem of aligning with the explanation if he's talking about first segment, second segment. Yeah. Right. Have you ever had to switch the segments? Or have you ever had to switch his explanation around to fit your order? I mean, I can't. I, I know I considered it, but I'm not sure I actually did it because sometimes it doesn't work to do that. So I can't remember a specific instance now. Mm-hmm. maybe I, I think maybe I did once or twice yeah if it if it seemed not to distort what he was saying I mean for me yeah, I would have free leeway with that I would, I would say yeah just make it make it fit in English as if it if you need to switch things around but anyway oh, thank you yeah. for that mm-hmm. for that question Avery Udagawa has a question that is Good. What resources, if any, are there in English these days regarding the social setup of haiku in Japan, the association circles, schools, newspaper columns, etc.? I know this was like my first question to you, even before I met you, you know, reading these profiles, like what is this world and how do we like, you know, my question is like, for example, like, you know, a lot of po- a lot, even even a lot of very famous poets in the U.S., like former, former poets laureate and things like that. Uh-huh. You can usually just get in touch with them or you can like pay them money and they'll teach you a class or it's, it's usually very, very easy kind of to get in touch if you want to. Is it the same? In, in yes, the- I think it is easy. There's, I think there's a book, maybe someone, Kakutani-san or somebody can, or you could call it the, the Gendai Haiku Kyokai, the Modern Gendai. Haiku Association. They've put out two books. And there's another one whose name I forget, but if you look up Modern Haiku Association in English, if you Google it, they have a web page and they do a lot of outreach. And if you wanted to contact a particular poet, I'm sure you could do it through them because most people belong to that association or the, I think there's another one whose name I can't remember at the moment, but it's quite similar. So there are these associations and I, I think there's some kind of a- address and name book of writers in Japan that may include haiku poets, I'm not sure, but how to get a hold of them. And they all, most of the groups have their own websites now. Ozawa-san's group does. So you can always contact people through that. Contacting people is not so difficult. Now, I think part of Avery's uh, question too was about doing this in in English. I remember before before I had an understanding really of Japanese, I'd, I'd try to figure something out and I'd just hit some wall of, of text. And like a website, a Japanese website makes a lot of sense in a Japanese cultural context, but like in an English context, it doesn't work a lot of the time. Yeah. And uh, that can be very kind of disheartening for someone who's not very confident kind of in in well, so you like know, language resources, I guess, sort of. Is, is there any? Is there any? There yeah, is a lot on the web. I mean, one place to start is Gaby Greve, G A B I G R E V E, has a sort of collection of websites that cover many things in Japanese culture. And a couple of them are about haiku. And she, she cool. has a lot of quotes from different works and a lot of poems. The organization is sometimes a little bit difficult to follow, but it's extremely useful. And mm. you'd be surprised as you go from one thing to another and click on the links, there's a lot of information about in English. But the thing that, that I think the question is directed to, is there some sort of overarching explanation? No, mm. there isn't. 
I don't think there is. And I think it's because it's such a diverse world. It's not like a university or, you know, the Association of Sonneteers of, you know, <laughs> Great Britain or something, which doesn't exist. I just made that up. I hope that um, exists. Just so that. <laughs> <laughs> but there isn't anything like that because everyone is basically doing their own thing. And you have so I was just as I was reading it the other day, I saw one of the poems that I like which I didn't introduce today, is by a woman who belongs to a four-woman haiku group, a haiku group of four women only, which produces its own little magazine and so on and so forth, and is well known enough for Ozawa-san to have included her poem. You you would email that person and get on their mailing list and they would mail like mail you this this little magazine. Uh -huh. Right. Would. Right, right. So anyway, there isn't any overall structure like that, but you can find out a lot by going through individual things. And, you know, this is Japan. So if you have an overall structure, it might not actually be what you want. It may right. take you in directions you don't want to go. And right. actually, so I think one of the ways people keep their freedom is by being a little bit less organized than maybe it would be convenient for yeah. outsiders to, to see. There isn't one voice. There are many, many voices. Well, someone should scrape the data off, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> make it would make be, an English language thing. Right, there. right. An MA or a PhD on the sociological structure. There's a guy called, um, his last name is Gilbert. I can't remember his first name, but he's a university professor. And he's associated with someone called Ito Yuki, I think, who's written some wonderful essays on the internet about mm. modern haiku history and its relation to politics and so on. So mm. these are places to go. Yeah. Cool. I think you um, mean Richard Gilbert. Gilbert, G-I-L-B-E-R-T is his Richard. last name. Richard Gilbert. Right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Richard Gilbert, that's right, yeah. He's amazing in terms of the stuff he's done. So th that's a whole, yeah. And through him, you probably will, get a link to Ito Yuki, who's done fantastic articles about what the haiku poets went through in the early 1940s and how they were arrested and confined and so on. And Kyo, Takahama Kyoshi's role in that, which is not pretty. So there's a lot, there's a lot of history that, that should be taken up. Cool, that sounds like some nice, you know, starting points for people if they want to get, yeah, Hi. get more involved. And the next question is from Emily. Janine, I am such a fan. Yes, I am too. So <laughs> she's saying, and the, but the question is really uh, pertinent, I think, it, and, and it's something that, um, you know, I'll just, I'll just read. Recently, I got the chance to work with a poet on some translations. I came up with the drafts I was happy with, but when I talked to him about them, he pointed out some things that were different uh, from what he intended. So I had to come up with poems, but they were not the poems I, they are not the poems he had written. Do you ever have these sorts of anxieties? And if so, how do you cope? Now, I'll just say like a lot of, so, so, so I actually, I was thinking about this because, well, many of the poets in this, in this, in this uh, anthology are, have passed away. But some of them, and one of them that you read is actually very much alive and was publishing, and is publishing. So how do you do that? Or, or just how do you approach, you know, questions or, or That's you know, so often? funny. I have three things to say about that. One is that, that last year I was asked to translate one poem, a free verse poem for a young poet. And I didn't really understand it. And I consulted my live-in partner. <laughs> my husband, who's very good on poetry, and he didn't really understand it. And so I asked the poet, he said, oh, just do whatever you want. Because <laughs> you know? I think that he didn't really mean it to be strictly understandable. So I did what I could do. And that happens, especially with younger poets, and, you know, contemporary poets, but then there are poets who are very strict about what they want. With, and th then there, I, I try never to translate a poem without first really going through everything and understanding everything about it. Cause I don't want to get wedded to something that then turns out not to be right and have to suffer by giving it up. 
Yes, I would recommend uh, for anyone thinking of translating a book of poetry that you should read the entire book of poetry before it. <laughs> oh, right, and you should know, you should understand yeah. everything about how the poems work, what they mean, yes. what the poet is trying yeah. to do. And you should also go back and, and if you feel it's necessary, look at the poet's life so that you know, you know what reference is referenced. Not that you're gonna put it in the poem, but it changes the way you do things a little bit. So before I translate a poem by a poet, like, or with these poems with Ozawa, someone else asked if his explanations help translate the poems, help me as I translate, and completely. Without them, I don't think there would have been any point in doing them. By the way, there are 20 poems by him at the end of the book, and I meant to read the last one, but I didn't get around to it. But just let me read it. Yeah, it's, it's really nice, and it's a good way to, where is it? Almost sliding into the sea, the winter sun lights the horizon. Almost sliding into the sea, the winter sun lights the horizon. I thought that was a nice way for the book to end because the book is ending, sliding, the sun is going down, but it's leaving a light on the horizon. It leaves what you call yoin in Japanese, a suggestion behind. But the but when Ozawa-san sent those 20 poems, he sent a little, what you call a kogoyaku in Japanese, a sort of colloquial, ordinary language translation of just one line with each one, because no one these days really understands literary Japanese well enough. I mean, most people don't to really, you know, get it. So, yeah, I, th I think you have to read the poem as much as you can and see if you understand how it works and then check it out with the poet or with an explanation by a scholar or another poet that you feel you can trust and then make a translation. And then if the poet's alive, you take it to him and he doesn't like it or he feels something wrong, then try to fiddle around with it till he's happy. But sometimes you can't make people happy. So then you maybe you have to give up. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes they're just doing a power thing, you know, like, so you have to, you may have to say, no, look, you know, this is the way I'm doing it. You don't like it. You can ask someone else and, you know, have your own powers translator. Cause I, this has never happened to me, but I I've read stories of the original author sort of trying to use the translator as a puppet and, and, and do that. And especially with a male female dynamic, I think that can be stronger. So that would be something as I say, it's yeah. never happened to me. I've had wonderful experiences, but I can imagine this happening. Yeah, me too. But I, I you know, I've, but I, I too have heard heard those um, heard those stories. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, it's really hard to sort of, you know, get into the personal politics of, you know, yeah, how you know the relationship between the translator and the author can get, yeah, murky quickly. But this this next uh, question actually kind of will segues on that it's from and when you translated uh haiku were you conscious of uh, the gender uh, of the poet and did that reflect in the final translation and actually that is gonna piggyback on my well my own comment was that i have the fortune of, of being having translated books of poetry which means that i get very very in touch with the poet's voice and actually with with sonic piece which which i co-translated we translated about half the poems in the book before we realized that we were fundamentally uh, missing the voice. It was, we weren't connecting with what the author really was trying to put forward. So we, it was a lot of work for us, but we had to go back through the first half of the book and like kind of get it. And, and for her, uh, gender is, is big and mm -hmm. who, who she is as a, as a poet. But with these kind of, with an anthology, I mean, I, I just think like, how is that? It must be difficult because you, you have one or two examples, you know, of a poet. And how do you, how do you get into that to that poet, you know, as you say, you can sort of research their life, something like that. But maybe specifically to the question, you know, were, were you conscious of these, of of the gender? And did I was that... conscious of whatever Ozawa-san was conscious of because I completely gave myself not always, but most of the time, I would begin from where he was. And th there, he, he one of the things he did is he made a special effort to choose poems by women. And he has some very interesting poems by women poets who've been totally forgotten, at least two, especially from Meiji early and um, Taisho, which I wanted to introduce, but there wasn't time. So, 
but they they don't i don't know i'm a woman myself so it's natural to me if they're speaking like a woman that i'm going to speak like a woman you know it, it doesn't factor in really it's just part of the poem mm. So yeah. yeah, it's kind of hard to answer that question. When I'm translating, for instance, Yosano Akiko, and I've translated hundreds of her poems. Yeah, I mean, she's conscious of being a woman. So you naturally, you know, translate. I, I don't know. I really don't know how to answer that question. Because I think it depends on whether or not you think women and men speak differently. And when they're speaking as poets, well, Yamakawa Tomiko, who is a friend of Yosano Akiko, did speak like a feminine woman in her poems. But Akiko in her poems, it seems to me, speaks more, it, it's her heart speaking. It's not her body. So I uh, know, I'm sorry, I should take that back. It's too complicated. No, um, Janine, I think what you're saying is, is, is honest and it's really, it's cool to, cool to sort of just, yeah, hear that. Yeah, it reminded me of something, you know, well, persona poems present this problem all the time. And, and how do you inhabit, how is it, is it possible to inhabit, you know, someone else? And someone, I was attending a class recently and, and who was it? Adrian Mateka, he wrote a great book called The Big Smoke. It's about, it's, you should read it. It's an, Amer it's American poetry, but anyway, he, he's persona poem and he said, yeah, poems, don't always have to be truthful, but they have to be honest. So yeah. I think if you can kind of latch onto that, then maybe, but yeah, you're right. It's a difficult, complicated thing. And it's like on a case by case basis. I like what you said that, you know, o Ozawa-san made the choices and you are, you are really just translating, you know, his choices. And, and I think that's a good kind of stance to take. It's not, it's not Janine's anthology of, of haiku. Right. It's, it's Ozawa-san. So yeah. he kind of, yeah, can make a lot of those decisions in that case. I love that he 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 decided to include so many women poets, female poets. He says in his forward or or afterward, I forget which, that by making he he wrote these. This anthology is a compilation of articles that he published over a period of ten years, which just introducing modern haiku poets. And he said, as a result of putting it together, that he's come to realize that part of the work of a haiku poet is not just writing poems, but to create anthologies, by which he means that he's actually creating a picture of an entire era or giving his, his version of the history of haiku, if you will. And so his including women, consciously including women, and consciously including literati poets, people who were not specialized haiku poets is part of what he's doing. It's, it's significant that he's doing that. And it's gonna make his view of modern haiku different from the normal mainstream one, maybe. Yeah, it's cool. And, and uh, you know, maybe he can push the mainstream closer to push his version, you know, bring it a little closer because as, as you produce things, you also affect the things that- right. uh, you are producing that is cool i'm just looking oh by the way we've been you know janine has been giving a lot of really great resources like ito yuki richard gilberts there's links to all of that in the chat i think if you can scroll up you can see uh, gendai haiku i haven't clicked on these uh, but susan jones just uh, posted gendai haiku uh, dot gr dot jp um mm -hmm. maybe there's there's a, a few other messages right yeah, so actually quick note on the chat. Well, I actually, I think you can download it. Everyone can download this whole chat. So you should all, you should all do that. How, little... how do we download it? Okay, so there are three dots on yeah, the chat. If you chat. click on that and you can yeah. click on save chat, it'll save to your computer automatically at the end of the session. Once, once we end this Zoom meeting, it'll mm -hmm. show up as a text file on your computer. And that goes for anyone participating. You can do that. It's in a folder called Zoom under documents. Okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. Because there's a lot of great, yeah, information in addition in addition to, to links and stuff. Well, I don't think it doesn't, um, unless I missed a question, uh, someone should raise their hand uh, if, if they did or if there's any more um, questions, we'd love to talk Can about. Can I just quote what David Burley says? <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. The Haiku International Association, or HIA, for which David, by the way, has translated 
um, among some of their books, has a small office and staff and a website and has links with the three large umbrella organizations. But as Janine says, the whole situation is diverse and complex. At this last sentence that I'm about to read is what I love. There are immense networks of influence and allegiance that is so perfect. Influence and allegiance is exactly what it's about. So it's quite medieval in a certain sense, but at the same time, very enjoyable. Yeah, I can only I can only imagine what that must be. Yeah, moving up through kind of like the haiku. I mean, I noticed some of the people in here. You know, they first came. They won like a koshien haiku koshien, which I didn't know existed. <laughs> but you know, that must be a whole kind of world in and of itself. Um, oh, another thing is that, that there are a number of prizes. And at first, I wanted to include the names of every prize in the profile, because Ozawa-san did. And uh, when we, as we got in it, there were so many, it was like, you know, we were all seeing stars. So we decided just to call it prize winning, and not specify the prize if the poet had won it, except for one prize, which is the Ida Dakotsu prize, because that's really, really important. That's like the Pulitzer prize in haiku. So that, those are the kind of adjustments that we had to make. Yeah, that comes back to production. production. Right. right, that was a group decision. Well, actually it was Yuiko and Mai's decision. Well, we have a question from Lisa. Janine, would you tell us about your process when you're translating poetry? This doesn't need to be restricted to the book, especially because you were following Ozawa-san's commentary and his reflections. Yes, Janine, please tell us, like when you sit down in front of a computer, like you get a fresh poem and it comes out. What do you, well, like a Jap like you get a Japanese poem and it's there on the page. Like, what do you? If, if it's a poem that, I usually don't sit down in front of the computer first. Mm. I'll sit down with the book. And well, like when I'm doing Yosano Akiko's poems, I decided to read through all of her poetry collections, which are over 20, it's like thousands of pages. And I just did that for a year. I haven't completed doing it. And I go through just reading, not thinking, reading, because I, I knew that I couldn't use poems. I couldn't do all of them. Like there'd be like 600 po tanka, this is tanka, Mm. And maybe five of them I would have room for in my book. So I would do like 40 poems in an hour, you know, just da, 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 not worrying if I understood it or not. And if something leaped out at me, then I would check it. And then I would make a tentative translation. And then after I did that, after I do that, I'll go, but after I finished one poetry collection, say maybe 500 poems, I'll go back and then try to whittle it down to maybe 20 poems and then start, then maybe I would sit, I don't know at what point I sit in front of the computer with Akiko, but I would try to figure out what they meant, look up the words I don't know, go as far with it as I can, see if I can find other people's um, explanations about it. Even one sentence can be very helpful go through everything that I have, maybe look it up on the internet to see if anyone else has thought it worthwhile mentioning, and then try to make a first tentative translation that I'm not too attached to. And then if I have questions individually that I still don't understand, I'll usually ask my husband first, although I don't like to admit that because that sort of weds me to it. But in fact, I'll ask him. And, and I might, there were other people, Takagi Kyoko, who Amy Heinrich and I both were very indebted to as a teacher. I would have asked her and so on and so forth. I'll ask around people that I know. And then when I feel I've understood it, then I'll start trying to translate it. And I'll do several versions until I think one is fantastic. And then I'll start, you know, screaming it around the house. This is great. You know, if you don't like this, you're going to get garroted, you know, and then I'll look at it the next day and I'll say, oh, <laughs> I didn't do that right. You know, so it goes back and forth with this agony and ecstasy thing. Yeah. And then, then I try to let it sit for a while and then and then I'll look at it and if I think it works, maybe I'll use it. And then I'll try to write an explanation for it. So that's, and that, that's not too different from what I do with Ozawa, but I think that 
with the poems in this book that I don't have the same attachment because I don't know the poets as well. And I didn't choose those poems myself. So it yeah. takes a little bit longer to get into it. But yeah, that, but that's basically what it is. You know, read it, try to understand it, whatever, whatever you can do, ask people, read things, try to make a translation, look at it, then try to separate it from the Japanese. That's important. See if it works on its own. Yes. And then if you think it does, you know, then, you know, write, this is today's version, you know, version 35, then look at it the next day and then keep, it's like, you know, you know, the Charlie Chaplin movie, Limelight, where Mr. I forget his name, he runs a flea circus. And there's a marvelous scene in that where he's, This is the fleas, you know, he goes up like this. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see my hands. If you go like this, you know, he calls them by name. You know, he goes like this and he makes the flea jump onto his hand. And then when it's jumped here, then he holds it up here, makes it jump here. And he does it so it gets closer and closer and closer. And that's how I sort of see translations sometimes. You know, this would be the Gembun, the original Japanese, and this would be your translation. Mm. And you keep sort of going back and forth, back and forth. The thing about the Chaplin thing is what's what you see is his eyes. His he's going like this. Like so he's that. totally focused on one, even just for a minute. He's totally focused, and then he's focused right. on right, the and then he's focused on the other, and that that is really what it feels like when when I do that. So that's how I. Uh, translate or I mean, don't translate you know there's a lot maybe kind of for non-poets in there like just just uh, i think it's something i would try to tell to, to sort of people who aren't so familiar with poetry itself is just how much how many versions there are you make of them the new york times had a really excellent graphic or interactive in which they broke down an elizabeth, an elizabeth bishop poem and they had like history of it so they could see like over over months you know it was it was compiled up and you know not unlike I mean translations obviously very different in that there's this you know two language components but the process I think is is sort of like a, a discipline and I think it's sort of very important for me for me I gain a lot of value when I when I transcribe the poem from well, when I transcribe it off of a, of, a, of a page in a book and I type it into a computer and I, I type in Japanese and if I, if there's some kanji, I don't know what it is, you know, I have to like write it, you know, and like it, it requires me to close read the poem. So that's like my own kind of thing. And, and that really helps yeah. me. Too. That's very important, writing the poem down. I do that too. Yeah, very important. Yeah. Marion says... <laughs> now she only sees please. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, Mary. I shouldn't have told you. I shouldn't have said that. I don't really feel that so much now. It's like an image that came to me several years ago, but I've kind of forgotten it now. <laughs> it well, it works. I, I mean, it's very well that your image of the fleas works. Well, um, I'm a Charlie Chaplin fan, so yeah, but I, cool. I think you know the, the thing about translation is that it really is a kind of close reading. As yeah. you're translating, you are close reading. And in order to begin translating, you kind of need to do it. So it's that that's the interesting thing about it and why it's so helpful for a poet like yourself, because you're learning to really analyze and look at what's going on. I mean, it's helped my own poetry like, like so much just being being into not not only just learning about you know different word choices or whatever but yes close reading poetry um, is incredibly valuable for my own um, personal development too which is really cool yuiko kimura has uh, janine do you feel significantly different when translating tanka and haiku oh that's a good that's an interesting question yeah yeah i sort of do because in tanka i think you can be much freer with the layout of the poem, mm. whereas in haiku, it's kind of, I think it's a little bit more difficult to be that free with the layout, but I think the process is basically the same. Yeah, yeah. You can be freer with the layout just because you have more 
more so more breaks kind of to deal with like you have those two yes, extra longer <sighs> yeah and it's often you know Oka Makoto once said that a tanka is equivalent to a full-length poem in English huh. so I don't know if he would have said that about a haiku but if yeah. there's yeah who was it I was trying to I remember now we're getting into just conversation but I remember I was trying to tell you someone who told me about hike like the difference between haiku and tanka was that it's like a volta and a, a, like like there was supposed to be a more like like tanka is supposed to have like in a traditional form it's supposed to have like a moral thing at the end and then haiku like cuts that off it's it's very different in its intentions and it, the kind of vocabulary it allows and yeah. in all ways in the way it was written. And I don't think you can say that the last two lines of the Tonka are immoral. That's like, I don't so, know where that comes from. Well, it came from, oh man. No, I mean, I don't know why. Well, I know, I believe you. <laughs> what it's based on, yeah, but it's okay. One of my first interactions with Japanese poetry really was was Tonka and it was uh, Juliet Winter's Carpenter. Yeah. 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 When yeah. I was able to read the Tawaramachi in the original too, like it was amazing. Yeah. Well, Tawaramachi writes Tonka in modern Japanese, which is very, you know, unusual. Most Tonka yeah. poets are still using bungo, literary Japanese, and haiku poets too. So Ozawa san says in the introduction to his book, that when he first began writing the columns, he soon realized that most readers couldn't understand the haiku because they didn't know literary Japanese. So he started putting colloquial translations at the beginning. So some of those I cut out because I didn't need them because the poem was already in colloquial English when I right. translated it. But it was very interesting that, that he was so aware of that and of how you know something that's an inheritance of the Japanese people is really not accessible to many people anymore. And that's one of the virtues actually of continuing, you know, to write haiku of, of, of the great popularization of haiku that's going on. I don't know if, um, Lynn, I wonder if Lynn knows if um, Itsuki-san, what's it, Natsui Itsuki-san, this person who's popularizing haiku on um, NHK, does she, is her her are it's, her not, it's not an NHK. It's oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's a totally independent. I think Natsui Itsuki. Yeah, I found some of her YouTube videos. They said they were from NHK. That's why I said that. But uh, forget that. But, but but you but you watch her on TV, right? Well, she the way she explains it is, of course, she is obviously the product of the haiku world. But I think she's found a way of really connecting into every topic in daily life and very modern they you know they even write are you, are haiku you, about about electronics or yeah shaved ice or these things so she's really brought it into the current idiom are you aware if she uses literary japanese bungo or or if they're written in cold so all of the haiku on the programs that i've seen have been totally today's Japanese. Really? That's interesting. But there are kigo, and those are often in the older forms, I believe. I don't know anything about haiku, but I found her, her interpretation of what's important in a haiku to be extremely insightful about Japanese as a language mm -hmm. and getting across images mm -hmm. through language to other people. Mm -hmm. And for a translator, you know, of any kind, that's really what we are trying to do yes 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 yeah so that's one of the issues in modern haiku you know is it going to be using modern language or is it going to continue to use literary and i think ozawa-san even if it's modern images and many of his poems are modern images in the poems in his book that, that they seem all to be using the literary language yeah. You know, actually, Janine, that brings up a point that I realized while well, speaking about like uh, sort of traditional forms, I guess, you know, that this book um, is divided into seasons. And I should, I just want to note for anyone who's still, you know, around, there's beautiful photos that divide out these. So like at the end of spring is summer and summer has like a spread of photos of summer in it. And it's really cool. 
just to have that kind of break in, in again in constructing you know a text and what a text is but point out is that there's 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 the four seasons and then there's also a section on new year haiku on new year but that section is much much slimmer than the other four and is that something where were there many more new year's poem uh, haiku before or has it always been less or is that something that's decreasing as well i don't really know the answer to that i bet emiko miyashita if she's still here would know the answer but i think mm. she may have left no she's here direct message oh no it's asking me to write to her i guess if she was here she would be speaking up yeah, yes i'm here oh you're here could you ask me that question i actually the 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 season like a uh, spring it has three months right but new year has only like two weeks oh right maybe that would explain mm, mm, mm. that's right the duration of time for the kigo to to present itself is very limited for the new year uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm. that makes a lot of sense yeah is it only limited to new like for example are there obon haiku or, or or around other sort of major holidays uh, well or... obon is included in autumn season i think it's uh, it's around august uh middle of august so from august 6 actually it's official beginning of autumn so it's autumn Kiko. right okay. there are several poems about obon in the book okay but, but they don't get their own section no. it's just no, okay. you don't do the micro seasons. You know, it, Japan has yeah. a system of 72 micro seasons. Yes. So if you arranged haiku by that. <laughs> Sorry, could I just say that I think the, exist, the separation of new year is because of the shift from the lunar calendar to the solar calendar. Oh, That's yes. That's the origin of it. Otherwise, otherwise it would be all, as, as Janine says, it's, it's micro seasons. But, but in, the, all, in the lunar calendar, I mean, new year was the beginning of spring. Yes, yes. But then when That's, you went to the solar calendar, it didn't work anymore, so. Right, and one of the poems in the New Year section is how he's looking out at the, at the mountains and everything is, is snowy, whereas by the old lunar calendar at the New Year, spring was beginning. Am I correct? Right, exactly. Yes, yeah. So that's that yeah. whole theme of this shift from the lunar to the solar calendar is so incredibly important in understanding how it felt to be alive at a certain time you know and that's a sort of it's it's let me just see yeah it's by Muro Saise who's a bunji no haiku he was better known as a poet of modern verse and a fiction writer which page is that Janine? it's which page 21 21 okay and he wrote he's one of the the most important poets of modern Japan in free verse so his thing is on New Year's, I look out at the mountains, but all is snow. And he says, when the Japanese government adopted the Gregorian calendar, that's the solar calendar in 1873, the start of the new year and the first day of spring, which coincided under the traditional lunar calendar became separated by more than 30 days. The poet feels something lacking when he looks out at the nearby mountains on New Year's Day and sees no sign of spring. Yet, despite his discontent, the immaculate snow makes him feel the purity and auspiciousness of the new year. Plain and simple though its expression is, this nuanced shift lends the poem added richness. There are two seasonal images, New Year and snow, both of them weighty, but in this case, New Year dominates. So he's, besides telling you what it was like to be alive when we were changing from lunar to solar, he's slipping in this little bit that you can have two seasonal images in a poem. <laughs> you know? So in the original collection where it appears, this poem is followed by New Year, Mountains Behind Mountains, and All is Snow. To me, the first poem, Shift of Feeling from Mountain to Snow, makes it the more interesting of the two. And then here, so he ends with this little remark that tells you how you should make a poem. So the, the, the ex explanation covers so many things, but the reason I wanted to read it is that, that it tells you, as I said, what was it like to be when time itself was changing because of the 
the things that we impose on it, the divisions that we impose on it. And it's, it's really, it's so connected to what it was like to move from an agrarian to a more urban society and all these kinds of things, the feel of life at that time, which is something that I think is so hard to grasp. But thank you, David, for saying that. That's so helpful. Thank you. Wow, I just learned, I learned so much. That was really cool from, from everyone. Yeah. Well, I don't see any, I don't see any further questions here. We are actually almost at about time, I suppose. Yeah, I think so. And I'd like to say thank you to you, Spencer, for moderating and asking insightful questions. And of course, to Janine for lending us your time this morning and your, your wonderful insights as, as, as a translator taking on this kind of project. And big shout out to members of your team who also participated um, in today's meeting. Thank you very much.